Hello, everyone. When Tim overcame his overwhelming fear of public speaking to deliver me and a congregation of friends the best, best man speech I have ever heard with Stuart Lee style comedic precision, I thought to myself, if he ever asked me to return the favor, I think he set the bar a little too high. It's difficult to know how to condense such a brilliant, complicated man into a eulogy. All I can do is impart a little of my wealth of experience shared with Tim. I was in a two-man band with Tim for more than 13 years called The Correspondence. To quote him, we made not particularly popular pop music that filled a big enough niche to take us around the globe many times and provide a surprisingly stable career for the two of us with the help of our manager, Abel. I've spent more time sitting with Tim in transit than I have in my own kitchen. In fact, I think I can say I've spent more time with Tim than any other human. I won't bore you with rock and roll tales, mainly because both of us favored a good night's sleep in a hotel room with decent Wi-Fi and water pressure over the sticky aftermath of a gig. In fact, the events that make me laugh the most are the small subsidiary incidences. I once informed him before going to Moscow for a gig that the temperature was minus 28 degrees. He forgot this piece of information or chose to ignore it and turned up at the airport in a decidedly spring-summer look. Our post-gig taxi was late and we had to wait out the front of the club and I have never seen a man scramble through a backpack faster to fashion gloves out of socks and then ask me if it was appropriate to wear his boxer shorts as a hat. <laughs> Touring with Tim wasn't always easy. He could be irritable and moody at times, but he very rarely lost his unique mix of cynicism, curiosity and impeccable manners, which basically meant that he would hold the door for you, carry your bag, inform you of an interesting fact about dialects while asking you about yours, and take the piss out of your shoes simultaneously. <laughs> for some reason, this approach worked particularly well with sound engineers, and he could derail an obnoxious performer backstage without them even knowing and make a nervous lighting tech feel completely at ease. As a music producer, he had a stroke of real genius. For a man who didn't particularly like clubs or dancing, he made some truly astounding dance music that could make me and a crowd of any size completely lose it every time. He had an intuitive understanding of drum patterns and he liked complexity. He preferred chords to single notes. He distrusted the easy route to a hook. In fact, I think he distrusted the easy route to anything he loved to know, truly know, and truly knowing means understanding the mechanics behind ideas. He had no time for mysticism, spirituality, and religion, lots of time for science, hated opinion pieces, loved empirical facts. He wasn't content to have a cursory understanding of, say, chaos theory. He would watch a week's worth of YouTube lectures, and then he would relate his understanding of feedback loops and dynamical systems to, say, winning the lottery. Then he would research the probabilities of winning for each lottery on the market, then do an entire cost breakdown of the jackpots, which not only included his ideal home, car, Fiat 500, <laughs> computer setup, and monthly subscriptions, but also which charities he'd support and who of his friends he'd offer financial help. He applied a rational thought process to his relationships, too. This may sound perverse to say, but I loved how prudent Tim was with his affection. It meant that when he received a compliment, an endearment, or a hug, you knew he really meant it and he'd really thought about it. It makes me think that most of us use our superlatives too often and their meaning is diluted. I also loved his straight down the line generosity. A couple of years ago, he said, I haven't got you a birthday present this year because I couldn't think of anything and I didn't want to buy you something pointless. Okay, Tim. Then a few months later, here is a gift that you genuinely need. Touch screen gloves. <laughs> okay, Tim. Well, you've been complaining that your hands are cold while cycling and you always get lost. Now you can check Google Maps and keep your hands warm. <laughs> okay, Tim. Thank you. That is genuinely useful. I think everyone here knows that at times Tim found day-to-day -day life, relationships and work, and work challenging. This was often not helped by his stubbornness and his self-appointed role as the ambassador of devil's advocacy, which could be hilarious one minute and infuriating the next. I think he was often too intelligent for his own good and his ability to argue his way in and out of other people's suggestions or advice. The tragedy is that I genuinely think that he was finding a route to happiness with a change of direction towards coding, which he loved for its binary format. It was an enthusiastic reset but like much of our time together, he was in transit, 
fully trained up, but without the structure of a job, and COVID had significantly delayed his arrival time. I'm just so sorry he never felt that sense of accomplishment that was just round the corner and long overdue. I hope he at least understood the significance of his achievements in his 35 years. His legacy is huge and he would have been deeply embarrassed by the outpouring of love from friends and fans alike. Tim absolutely loved stargazing, mainly so he could relay his enthusiasm for astrophysics and muse on the idea of retiring somewhere with no light pollution. There were a few gigs we did, particularly in New Zealand, where the night skies were mesmerizing. He said a sky full of stars reminded him of the ridiculous improbability of his own existence, and he felt comforted by this. For all the ups and downs, I feel so privileged to have been part of his ridiculously improbable existence. And I miss him like a brother.